I want to just share with you why there is a uh, letter-filled tree behind me. Haha, ha, it's not a tree. If you thought it was a tree, you were wrong. I just want to make that clear because that's what I initially thought. So Mickey, uh, my wife, showed me a picture on, uh, on, on her phone of, of something that we could use to draw our attention to Jesus this season, right? And we understand that we're doing that all the time, but what, is, what, could, we, what could we focus our attention on? that would draw us maybe even deeper into God and closer to Jesus. And so the idea um, of this, this thing behind me, what is it? Any ideas? It's a Bible. It's a book. Some of you are like, Trey, what's wrong with you? Did you ever think it was something else? Um, yeah, it is, it is a, what would you say? That's right. It is a book. So this is, this is what we're in this season the word became flesh. It's really good news for you, and it's really good news for me. We may not all understand what that means, but I, I believe that as we unpack what it means that the word became flesh, we will find ourselves more fixated and more excited about the person of Jesus Christ and his kingly rule here for us now. That's, that's my hopeful anticipation. And I invite you into it with me. I want to pray and listen for a moment. And then we're going to go ahead and, uh, and jump in. So just pray with me. Father, there's nothing in me that can glorify you unless you do it. You have given me your spirit. You have welcomed us all into fellowship with you, Jesus, and this morning we welcome you and say, stay here, please. You speak, God. May your word be illuminated by your spirit. May no one hear a man, God, if, if, if people come and all they hear is a man not being me, then I missed it. Jesus, we want to hear you. And so we say thank you for speaking. In your name, Lord, be glorified. Amen. Amen. For those of you who might not know, <clears throat> we are in the Advent season. Advent is a season that uh, traditionally we look at in the Christmas season with this idea behind it of waiting. And now, I don't know what waiting looks like for you in your life, but waiting can hold different kinds of feelings for us, can't it? And I'm going to get to that in just a minute. But before I do that, I want to come back straight to this passage. It's in John's Gospel. Now, John's Gospel in the, in the, the Bible here is written by John himself, who is the disciple who the Scriptures say is the one whom Jesus loved. Right? Okay. Say that again. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Oh, no. yeah, this is true. John, so Shannon laughed. John wrote that about himself. That's, that's true. It's his own record of writing about himself. So that's, that's pretty funny. Nevertheless, it is in Scripture. <laughs> the Word of God says, that's funny, huh? Trey, right? I was the one whom the Lord loved. It's good. John is the one whom the Lord loved. There was something special, this relationship between Jesus and John. So John is writing in his gospel uh, his own account of his direct person-to-person -person relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, to, to make this really plain for us in here today, um, this historical record when it comes to Jesus, particularly when we get to the, the very clear and detailed life of Jesus Christ, this, this person who was born in Israel 2,000 some odd years ago, born into a, a manger, and we have these records, the question about him isn't about the historical record of, of Jesus of Nazareth being born or being in existence. The historical record, no one ever, very few at least, would challenge the historical record. The question always comes down to, who is this baby who was born in a manger? 
history isn't the issue. It's who we say that he is. The world over has to face and reconcile this question. Who is this baby born in a manger? Who kings sought to kill when he was born? It's a strange thing to do to a baby. I just want to point us to John's gospel when he says this about, about Jesus. Many would be familiar with what John starts his own gospel with. The verse 1 of chapter 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Move down to, I believe it's verse 14. Let me make sure I'm saying that right. It's verse 14, I believe, where he says this. Yes, he says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And so just in brief, as a foundation for this season, <laughs> Shannon's just smiling. And there's, people, there's just certain people in your life when they just smile at you, you just laugh. Like, you just make me happy. Don't stop. Sorry. Here's what the word says. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. So, so just to be really clear, his, there's two words that have to connect the word and his. You and I might think of word and we go, oh, word, like what Trey is speaking right now. Those are words that he's speaking. Or we might think of a book that's written down in letter and pen and ink or pencil or whatever. And we go, oh, word. But in order for John to be, to be writing down what's accurate, something within the word that he's talking about is associated with the person. To reconcile what that means, the word dwelling among us and his dwelling being here, we look at verses 1 through 17. And we come to find out that what John is saying is that ultimately the word who was always meaning there was a word that has always existed, was in fact the literal person of Jesus Christ. This is incredibly important to the whole, the whole gospel narrative, to our entire Christmas season. For those of you who are here today and maybe you don't know who Jesus Christ is, then welcome into the dialogue and the conversation of discovering what these scriptures mean and what it truly means that there was a baby a historical record of a baby in some far off place uh, that was born that all these records were kept of. The word is indeed a name for Jesus Christ. And John says, this word has always existed, which is incredibly important as well to the word becoming flesh, in case you get the word was God, the God became flesh and was ultimately born into a manger. And this is the entire account and purpose of Christmas. Nativity story is a record of the word becoming flesh and dwelling among us. But it's important. Jesus didn't all of a sudden appear into the world as a baby. It's not as though, to be clear, that Jesus never existed before. And then one day, God sends a gift to who we know to be Mary and a virgin birth, which has never happened before and never happened since, occurred. And all of a sudden, this new creation has come from Mary's womb. It's important that this is very clear to us because if that were the case, then this Jesus potentially couldn't be God. The record shows that, no, this God, John is saying, this one who was born from Mary's womb, is the word of God that has always existed. And it existed, he existed beyond the natural birth that we experienced in this world. This is vital to know that Jesus is God. It points to the miraculousness and the power of God at work in the entire narrative of the manger story. Are you with me? Colossians 1, 15, 16 says that 
Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. For all things were created by him, for him, and through him. The word became flesh. The eternal that always has been became human. It's radical. This necessity to understand this and to grasp the brevity of this thing. This is not just another Christmas. This is about a people coming in contact with the living, eternal God. Oh, dear baby Jesus. As long as when we say baby Jesus with a radical humility and reverence. He's not a baby who came all of a sudden. He's the God who always was. This is the foundation for us moving into this Advent season. And today, from that foundation of the word becoming flesh and dwelling among us, I want to look at part of this birth story, the record of Jesus being born. And we're going to find that in Luke's gospel, chapter 2. If you have your Bibles, you can open up with me. Yes. Yes, indeed. I mentioned waiting. And I, and I believe waiting is an important part of our lives. And we all experience waiting in different ways. And, and so I was just thinking about waiting and anything that I've been waiting on recently, and again, as I said, Advent, the season leading up to Christmas, which ultimately we're looking at the birth of Christ, but as we'll hear today, it's more than the birth of Christ. It's what this all meant for us is what really, 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 really matters. But so I was thinking about waiting, and uh, how many of you right now could just think there's something you're waiting for? Eh, It could be, I don't know, you know, Christmas, but there's relationships, all sorts of things we're waiting for. I was thinking in, in, a, in a way, I thought, you know what, that, we waited. So earlier this year, my wife and I, not very serious at all, but my wife and I had been preparing to purchase a new piece of furniture. And do any of you buy online and do that? You know, it's like iffy sometimes when you buy online. So we made the decision to go ahead and make a purchase online for a new couch that we had you know, saved and put, away, put aside money for. And uh, we had our furniture a long time. But anyway, so we make this purchase, find the right thing, and oh, thank you, God. That Waiting just to find the right thing is also it's important. Nevertheless, I digress. We, po- we bought this couch, and being as we bought it online, the company that we purchased it from, and I'm not going to tell you, so don't come to me afterwards asking because you don't want to support them. I'm not going to do that. But we buy it from them, and we read online that there might be some, you know, some lag time, potentially a couple weeks, but we knew there was a little bit amount, amount of risk involved, if you will. So we make the purchase, and I'll tell you what, um, we make the purchase, and around the time that we thought we would have heard some communication from them, we hadn't heard any, we hadn't had any communication with them. And, and so we waited. So I decided to go ahead and contact them. And uh, for those of you who know, I used to be a bill collector uh, for about five years of my life. Uh, But that life is gone. So thank God there's new grace for me living in me because I'm learning new ways of communicating all the time. And so I just just connected. Hey, haven't heard anything. They get back to us. This communication and contact began, uh, I think, about a two-and-a-half-month process for us. I think I'm saying that right. Um, not embellishing, but two to two-and-a-half months for us to contact them, hear from them. Wait. Contact them, or they finally, you know, maybe contact us. Wait. Now, mind you, they have our money already which is always the consumer's issue, right? And, you know, consumer's issue, and I'm not knocking, like, companies at all. I'm just saying the, the problem with the consumer is when you give your money, you hope for the service. That's one of the places God wants to free us. You know, how do we work that out? I don't know. 
keep praying. So we're waiting and waiting and waiting. And finally, after this, you know, back forth and these conversations, like, oh, God, thank you for the opportunity for more faith, <laughs> for more humility, because I certainly needed it. Uh, we finally, after, I said, two months or so, received our couch. And the first time we received it, actually, there was a delivery, and, and they delivered it with three, I believe, of, of the five parts that we had ordered and they walk it in, the guys, these are just, the delivery guys were awesome, you know, thanking them, loving these guys, like encouraging them, hey, can I help you? And they walk in, and they actually dropped four pieces off, and I said, you don't have the fifth piece, and so we looked at the others, and only three of them are right, one of them was wrong, and they didn't even have the final piece, and so, I said, thank you, Father. God, thank you for the joy of being approved. It's real. It is real. So they, they took it back, and finally, it was another couple weeks, and we, we got our whole pieces. But how many of you know what it's like to wait? Ah, yes. Breathe in, breathe out. I am waiting. You see, waiting for the fulfillment of anything can cause us great frustration, great angst. Even in anticipation of what is to come, there can be feelings that are so far out there, you don't even want to confess them this morning. But I tell you that waiting is something special. <clears throat> and this morning, I believe God wants to inspire us by truth to wait well. To wait well. And I want to look at Simeon's life to do that. We're going to find ourselves in Luke chapter 2, if you're already there. Good job. Give you another second if you want to get there. In this Advent season, to make our way to Christmas, I believe God does want us to have, and I, in fact, I know it, to have peace in our waiting. We all have moments of waiting, waiting for good things, waiting for things that, that we placed our confidence in, our hope in, and the waiting can be some of the most troubling times, can they not? And so this morning isn't about <clears throat> feeling the right way in the process of obtaining what God wants to give us in the waiting. You understand that? In the process of what we're waiting for, God is okay with us feeling what we're feeling. The issue that we're always brought back to, though, now is people who are looking to him and him alone for the process to be completed is God, will you handle my feelings? It's God, will you take what I am feeling, that frustration, that we might recognize is not from God. God, I am frustrated, but I thank you that in you, I have a way of obtaining hope and maintaining hope and peace. This is what we're looking at today in our preparation for Christmas. Let's look at this man of God whose name is Simeon to, to look at this question. Is it possible to wait with peace? Luke 2, 25 through 32. Simeon's story, just real briefly for you, is this. We find him in Luke's gospel, not in Matthew's gospel. But we find him in Luke's gospel after the birth of Christ. And for, for many of us, I would encourage you this season, take a look at the, the biblical narrative of the nativity story. There are some things within there without you needing to look at, at uh, context or look at a commentary or some academic study of Jesus' birth in Scripture plainly that will probably shake some of the things you've thought about the nativity story. How it happened, when it happened, where it happened, who showed up, at what time they showed up. And these things are important so much as they're continuing to draw us closer to seeing God for who he is and what's really happened. And I just give you that this season. Just sit with the Lord and in the scriptures and enjoy his presence. So we find that on the eighth day in verse 21, and prior to this text, we're going to read Jesus. When it was time to circumcise him, he was named Jesus. And this was the name that the angel had given him. So Mary and Joseph now have gone back to the temple to honor the purification law that was at the time for all children, for all boys, particularly in this instance. So they're back. They've now have left Bethlehem, where Jesus was born in 
what we consider a manger. I'm not going to get into the details of what that might have looked like or not, but <clears throat> it wasn't necessarily like a, a horse's stable. I think that's pretty clear. Even when it comes and it shows that the Magi ultimately came back to him, the Magi came to a house to visit Jesus, which is, which is in the scriptures. But, but ultimately, Jesus is now with his parents, not in Bethlehem and in Jerusalem. And here's where we find this scripture, verse 25 of chapter 2 in Luke. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. Everyone say righteous and devout. He was waiting, everyone say waiting. Okay. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. How did he go to the temple courts? He was moved by the Spirit of God into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God. So here's what we, here's what we know at the very least. Parents with babies are uncomfortable. He's like, Trey, you mean to say that this man, who we would assume to not know Mary and Joseph, maybe by first name at all, what he recognizes by the grace of God is the Holy Spirit, who is God on the earth. God told him in advance that he would get to see the Messiah who Israel had been waiting for, and his life wouldn't end here on earth before that would come to pass. So he sees in his spirit that the Lord says, that's him. And he swoops up Colleen and Shandon's little baby, precious Eden. And, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is a bold sequence that's taking place. You've got to understand, I think within the little details, we don't always imagine what it looked like and what it felt like and sounded like. And Some of you are people who might get really close to other people's babies. It's okay. Some of you parents are parents who don't like you people who get close to their babies. I'm just kidding. It's freedom and permission. It's grace. Listen, we're ha we, get to enjoy, we get to enjoy this time together. But listen, going up and, s and grabbing someone's baby who, whom you don't know is, is really crossing some boundaries, I would say. But, but we come to see Mary and Joseph weren't put off by it. And culturally speaking, there's probably there's some things within culture at the time that, that wouldn't have been that shocking necessarily. There's something within Simeon when he saw this little baby that compelled him to do this. <sighs> Simeon, verse 28, took him, who is him, Jesus, in his arms and praised God. The response by coming in contact with Jesus was to exalt and lift up God. That's why when you say when we talk about baby Jesus, please, please recognize Jesus was just as much king of the universe as a baby as he was before the foundations of the earth, as he was when he was hanging on a cross at Golgotha at the end of his earthly ministry, as he was when he resurrected from the grave, as he was when for 40 days he gave the signs that he was God by resurrecting from the dead, and walking and talking, and then his ascension. It's the same God. The response when we see Jesus is to say, God. Sovereign Lord, Simeon says, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. I want to say this, the beginning of Jesus' life also points us to the end of his life. And it's in this that in Jesus and through Jesus, God will receive his glory. And he's looking and receiving a people for himself. I'll make this statement and we'll continue to just to look at Simeon's life. But when we talk about the word that has always been the eternal God 
who's always been Jesus Christ becoming flesh and dwelling among us. Why? The word became flesh so that the spirit would pour out upon all flesh. Why? The word became flesh and dwelt among us that the spirit would then come. He was the way. Jesus made the pathway for all humanity to get God back. As he reminded John Piper says, this is the simplicity of the gospel is that people get God back. All this searching and pursuing in our life that has led to ends and dead ends and a dead end. And this one went a little farther and this was a dead end. I still left wanting for more and not satisfied. He says, Jesus becoming flesh dwelling among us made it that the spirit would now pour out on all flesh and we get God back. Listen, if this Christmas we're not figuring out and understanding that treasuring God and enjoying him and seeing him more clearly for who he is is, is the whole thing. It's, it's all of it. It's the baby in the manger. It's the why. For those who know Jesus, then let your boredom shake off. And let our lack of zeal and passion for seeing Jesus for who he really is get crushed for God's glory and for your gain and my benefit. It's not just another Christmas. It can't be. Can it be? I mean, can it just be another Christmas? Please, God, no. This year, God, I want to see that the word becoming flesh transformed everything. It literally transformed everything. And then all eyes, eyes on those who didn't even know God, people, magi from the east, were drawn by the symbol of God in the sky that would lead them to praise and worship this Messiah, this King. The eyes of the world are being drawn to Jesus. Simeon, a man who had waited righteous and devout for the consolation of Israel, is experiencing the fulfillment of his waiting. I believe all people are waiting for an encounter with God. I believe that. I believe that. You may not be convinced of it yet. God may get us there. But I believe that in our lives, people, just as I am, I'm wanting and waiting. God, there are still things that I haven't seen come to pass in my life that I so want to see come to pass. I need to see them. Don't you have those things? Simeon had been waiting faithfully, and here's what it says about him. Like Simeon, Jesus came... God becoming flesh, the word dwelling among us, so that we can be filled with the Spirit. Verse 25, Simeon, a righteous and devout man, lived in Jerusalem waiting for the consolation of Israel. In other words, one, one commentary says this, it says that he was waiting for the comfort that the Messiah would bring to his people at his coming. Now remember this, that Israel, the Jewish people at this time in history, we've been talking about this recently, but have to remember, try to imagine that this people is a group of people, a culture who had been living under oppressive rule for years and years, for centuries, in and out of centuries and centuries of other powers ruling them, not being free, not being free to have their own culture, not being free to experience people in their community leading them. They didn't have it. And so these messianic prophecies here in the Old Testament were in these five books, right, like the Bible didn't exist in the form we have it now. So Simeon isn't a righteous and devout man based off of him knowing the entire Gospels. We didn't, they didn't have those. They had the first five books of the Bible, and it was mostly oral tradition. That's why one of the requirements for young boys to become rabbis was that they had to have the first five books memorized to continue on to become a rabbi. Why? It was oral tradition. And so in this time in history, all of Israel was waiting for freedom. Here is Simeon, devout and righteous. Why was he righteous? Not because he knew the Torah. The religious leaders of the time knew the Torah. No, Simeon is a man marked by having, as David was, a heart for God. That's what made him righteous and devout. And he did care for the things that the word said. But so this man had been waiting and waiting and waiting. And he was waiting for Messiah who would bring his people 
out into freedom. And don't miss the connection between the people of Israel and humanity and you (laughs) and me, that there is a waiting for my freedom that Jesus brought. And for those of you who maybe, if you're like me, there's still more freedom I want. I am waiting for this freedom to show up in my life, whatever that might be. God, is, in a sense, is pointing out that there's a Messiah coming, and even Simeon says it. He says that this will be the Messiah that will actually be for all people, not just the consolation, and certainly not a consolation. It's an interesting word to use. But he's saying the comfort of Israel has come. Our freedom is here. The word has become flesh. Luke says that the Holy Spirit was upon him. Later, Luke would identify believers like this, Simeon, in this instance. He would no no longer say that the Spirit was just upon people, but that the Spirit has now filled people in the book of Acts. Remember, Pentecost hadn't happened yet. So the Spirit of God, as a reminder, was always, how can the Spirit be present when Pentecost hadn't happened? Listen, God has always been God, and he's always been pursuing people to have communion with him. And he'll do that by any means necessary for his glory and for our gain. A spirit-filled believer, obviously, we're saying in this sense that those who've encountered Jesus now say the lordship issue, as Simeon has clearly said, here is what he says, here is the Lord. This is the Lord. The sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of the people of Israel. The Lord became flesh so that we can be filled with the Spirit. And the second thing is this. Like Simeon, Jesus came, the Word became flesh so that we can walk in the Spirit. Verse 26, the Holy Spirit is the one who revealed to Simeon that he wouldn't die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Listen, the Spirit of God, God loves to speak to people, right? So here's a question maybe to ponder this morning as you're thinking about waiting. What word have you believed from God that has not yet come to pass? That's it. What word is it about your family that hasn't yet come to pass? Or what word is it about yourself from God that hasn't yet come to pass? You haven't seen the fulfillment show up in the natural yet. Maybe it's other things. Maybe it's other business things. Maybe it's jobs. But I would say this. If, if Simeon isn't a model for us, who was a man who was waiting for God to express his fullness in natural form, then let him be an example and a model for us. I would say this. If there are things, if we don't have anything we're ever waiting for and wanting more with Jesus, then we're missing out on the word that became flesh. Why? Because when the Holy Spirit comes, which is the essence of Jesus' coming into the world, is that we could be people now not distant from God, but now all people can get God back, have the Holy Spirit, God himself, living in them, drawing them towards him. The Holy Spirit's energy now and power is moved in drawing all humanity deeper and deeper into the truth of who Jesus actually is. It's the very nature of the Holy Spirit. And so because of that, I believe there's always some sense of waiting for those who are filled with the Spirit. You can challenge me on that, but I believe it's absolutely biblical. And so the idea is this, is that we don't wait, though, without peace, and we don't wait now without hope. We wait based off of the things that God has said, just as Simeon did. And waiting isn't in vain. That's how we can have peace in the midst of it. third thing is this. So we can be filled with the Spirit. That's why the Word became flesh. The Word became flesh that we can walk in the Spirit. And the third thing is Jesus came, the Word became flesh so that we can be led by the Spirit. Verse 27. Simeon was literally moved by the Spirit. That doesn't mean that God forcefully picked him up, although that would be awesome. Maybe it was. Lord, give me faith. I've heard plenty of stories. Actually, I had testimony, a guy levitating at a camp I spoke at. Why would God do that? It doesn't really matter to me. I want to see more. God, I want you to be God. I don't know. So 
In this instance, Simeon, I don't believe, was picked up physically by God and the Spirit. Being moved by the Spirit, he's, he's actually saying this, is that the inside of him, the inside of him now, but this was interesting because the Spirit was on him, but he was now stirred on his insides. His mind and his heart were being moved and compelled to go, which in a real way, the power of God, listen, is not my deal to limit, but I believe that there was a real power that was pushing him as well. <laughs> and God's a gentleman, like, God, you can push me all you want. So he was moved by the Spirit and thus went to the temple at the precise time Jesus' parents brought him for presentation. Paul says this about those who are led by the Spirit. He says that those who are led by the Spirit of God, Romans 8, are sons of God. And the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. The word becoming flesh affords now people the opportunity to be led by the Spirit, filled by the Spirit, to walk in the Spirit, which is personal, intimate, deep relationship, 100% connected to God. Not because of my self-proclaimed work or righteousness, but because of the word becoming flesh and dwelling among us. He made a way. This is the promise of Jesus being born into this world. something to think about you say the word the word was god it's jesus he always has been he always was everything was created through him for him and by him he then descends and humiliates himself self humiliation he chose humiliation so that we would never have to be humiliated humiliation would be something like being innocent not defending your innocence, people around you thinking who, people who think they know you, maybe thinking maybe he is guilty, maybe they did do it, allows himself to go to a cross and ultimately the beginning of Jesus' birth reveals the end of his life and ministry on earth in that we have a man filled with the spirit who is ultimately a picture of what Jesus was coming to accomplish that not just Simeon. See, at this time, Simeon was unique among people. Spirit of God on him, God speaking so plainly to him. Do you know that this is what Jesus has done for us? That you get God back. You hear from him. You get to know what it's like to see the way he sees, to feel what he feels, to carry his love into a world that is longing for a king. That's why the word became flesh. We're going to do something, um, something that will allow us to step into this waiting. Simeon, when he makes this statement, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. I don't believe that Simeon was all of a sudden saying, now I'll have peace. And that would be a, I think that would be a wrong interpretation of the scripture and of this life that Simeon was living. I believe what it's pointing to when he says, Lord, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. Now that the fulfillment of the word that you spoke to me however many years ago has come, God, you could do whatever you want with my life. He's saying, like, you gave me one word, and on the one word I was banking my entire life on. How many of us would love to say, God, I heard you say it, and now because you said it, I'm placing my whole life on it. Are you with me? Like, like God, because you said you would redeem my family, God, I'm placing all of my faith and life on the word that you spoke, not me. It doesn't have to do with me, but Jesus, that you said it. Here's where I see it in your word. I thank you, God, and I trust you, and I believe you. 
Father, and in the process, though, it's groaning at times, and it's arduous, and it's difficult and burdensome, God, I can have your peace right now. I believe Simeon had peace in the process because his anticipation was that God would fulfill what he said. That's it. God would fulfill what he said. Some of us hear that and say, oh, well, Trey, I mean, I heard this. I heard this at one point. You know, it certainly, and it didn't happen. It didn't. We start, we get in the habit, something happens in us, and we start to think when God did say something, and whatever appears to not show up in the natural, we go, oh, well, that didn't happen, that's not, I must, Mr. listen, here's what, here's what I would submit to you. In all things, God's word is never showing up false or inaccurate. But we are learning in the process what he means when he says it, his character in the process, and to be shaped by the word that he gave. You see, people for him are being born deeper and deeper into who he is. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, that we would be people who have peace in the waiting. God, I want peace. But Simeon was confident it would come to pass. You have been given today uh, a red card. Do you have that red card? This right here. Can you hold that up? Make sure. Does everyone have one? It's important. Some people don't have one. Is that correct? That's a better thing to do. Who does not have a little red piece of paper? Uh, can you help with that? Or did you want to share? Okay, make it share. You got them, Harvey? We grab, there should be some out there on the, on the desk. So we just grab this red piece of paper. So as we step into this, this time of, of movement, stepping into this place of Advent, our waiting, uh, Mickey's going to share with you what that looks like to actually connect this to Jesus himself in our process. Yeah, if you would hold your hands up if you don't have one of those. I'm going to give this over to Mickey. <laughs> Great. Um, excuse me. So we were just we were just in Minnesota, woo woo, for Thanksgiving. That's my home, um, and we had the privilege of and the honor of visiting my best friend um, and her husband and her family uh, right before we came back here. And um, my best friend Michelle, her husband Billy. Uh, since their marriage and since before that, he had headaches, headaches, headaches for a long time. Didn't know what it was. Sometimes he'd pass out. Um, and then a couple of years ago, found out he had brain cancer. And, <coughs> excuse me, he went and he had brain surgery to remove one of the tumors. And it was successful. Yay. And then um, about a year after that, he had to have another brain surgery for another tumor, and um, that was successful, yay. And then, um, so it's been a year since, about a year, maybe a little over, since that last brain surgery. So, you know, it was a lot, it was a long story, but it was a lot of waiting and wondering what was going on before we even found out he had brain cancer. Then when they found that out, okay, great, now, now we know what to do and we can take care of it. And um, since that last surgery, he now has this mysterious illness and uh, he will just uh, his lactic acid ba basically will calcify so he cannot so like when we visited him he couldn't move his hands um, he could this was about as far as he could close it and if you forced it closed he'd probably scream and pass out from pain um, and <laughs> Watching and being a part of this family, uh, Michelle is basically um, a single mom now because she's caring almost full time for Billy, but 
Um, he can't, you know, he never knows if he's going to be able to walk one day um, or do anything to help, you know, with the children. They have three children. Um, and <laughs> watching this family together and hearing from Billy, from Billy, mostly he said he has learned that he wants to um, suffer well and is learning what it looks like to suffer well. And he just kept saying over and over throughout the night how blessed he was, how blessed they were, um, you know, because some, you know, he was in the ICU for brain cancer, and then he would watch people, people, and people who had the same exact surgery as him, you know, pass away and not make it, and their children, and, and so he just continually, you know, we're just so blessed, we're just so blessed, you know, as his hands are, like, swollen, and he's trying to eat, and, um, what I saw was this family becoming, we're highlighting this word, became, becoming more like Christ through this. And we don't have all the answers. But I saw a family that is not listening so much to the words of men, the words of doctors saying it's a mystery, when they know, well, God knows. He knows exactly. We don't know why we haven't seen healing yet, but it's not a mystery to God. We have faith in God. And whether that means healing, you know, right now, which we're all believing for, or he absolutely knows that he is becoming and transforming into Christ. It's his spirit. And the flesh, <laughs> the flesh is, doesn't hold quite as much importance, but we see these children, you know, Michelle expressed about her, sometimes she went through this phase of feeling like, oh, my children are missing out, and my children, what is going to happen when they grow up? Are they going to be bitter against their dad because they didn't have a dad to play with them? And we just see God's faithfulness as these children are becoming so compassionate. I don't know if I've seen children so servant-hearted, so patient. And I can imagine that when they see other people suffering now, it's not with, you know, scared eyes, but it's with love and an I understand. And they're knowing more and more of who this Jesus is who came to suffer for them. And so God's words are just literally becoming flesh through them. His words that they're not alone. They're living this out. His words that he is their all. They're everything. And it was so moving and so beautiful. And if there's a family that's waiting, I mean, they've been waiting and waiting and waiting. But there's this peace that just penetrates them. And it's not something you can put on. It's not something you can fake when you're with them. It's real. And so today, right now, if this is something that resonates with you, that's like, man, I've been waiting, I've been waiting, and I want his word of peace to become flesh in me, you write that thing down. Whatever it is, you write it on this piece of paper. You use words <laughs> to write it down. And we're going to bring it forward. We're going to bring it literally <laughs> to the manger. We're going to bring it to Christ, to Christ himself, because that's the only way anything becomes something else, truly. That's the only way anything transforms and becomes into something is when we have Christ. When we bring it to him, when we let him in and transform it, there is a piece of sticky tape on one side. You'll peel off the little uh, protection on there, and you'll stick it on the piece words, and you'll watch as whatever it is you are waiting for becomes peace in your life as a physical representation of what we all desire <laughs> is for his peace. Let me pray. Father, thank you that 
thank you that the word became flesh. Your word, you are the word. Thank you, God, that this, this impacts right now. This is true for us right now, that this wasn't just some story many, many years ago that we fondly, oh, that's beautiful. It's right now for the messes that is and happening in this world, for the chaos that's going on. Your words reign above any words of men and flesh and nature around us, Lord. Your words are true and faithful and have been from the beginning and will be throughout eternity. And so right now we, with our faith, we pray for more faith, your gift of faith. As you, Holy Spirit, bring to mind those things that we're waiting for, we're hoping for, yearning for, groaning for, wanting to become peace in our life, not strife, Lord. It's a promise from you, and it's only done by you. Again, this isn't something we can muster up in our own strength. It's Holy Spirit, peace. Thank you, God, that you transform anything. Nothing is impossible for you. Nothing, not brain cancer, mysterious illnesses, broken relationships, broken families, bankruptcy, poverty, prejudice, politics, all of these things that we want peace for, Lord. Nothing is too big for you. You created it all. We're, oh, thank you, Jesus. So we pray, Father, as we write this, Lord, and we step forward to Christ, bringing this to you as in faith, in this Christmas season, that you will do what you say you will do. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.
God, this season, Advent, as we are waiting, waiting on the promises to come to their fulfillment. Thank you, Jesus, that in you, our frustrated waiting becomes peace. Our uncertain kind of waiting becomes glory. In you, Jesus, comes the hope of all abundance that ultimately and mostly is a life absolutely undone by your goodness. Walking, filled with your spirit, under the power and leading of your spirit, God, and being moved by your spirit. God, there's no greater life. And so as we wait, thank you, Jesus, that you are shaping us into the fullness of Christ who lives within. We claim that as our promise today. In our waiting, we are becoming more like you. So, Lord, thank you for fulfilling your word and for us, God, as a people, getting to groan and wrestle through and into truth together. We will not settle for less, God. We will not lower your promises, your word to what we're seeing, but, God, we will charge each other to say, keep believing. Our God is faithful. Father, today, for those who don't know what it means to be loved and known by you, Jesus. I thank you for the grace of your invitation falling upon them by your power to say, Jesus, you came, you became a man, Jesus, that ultimately we, I, they would get God back. And so thank you for revealing that to us today, Jesus. We love you. We say, speak all that you want to speak for your glory and for our gain. In your name, Jesus, amen.